Well, today we're going to start a new chapter for this course. Chapter 8, Logical Design for Database System. Well, uh, the system design stage involves logical and physical design. So today we're, we're going to look at the logical design process and uh, in the next class, which is the last class of this course, we look at the physical design stage. Again, the system design includes two stages, logical and physical design. You are developing data and process models for the pro proposed system from which physical models suitable for implementation are created. So this chapter, again, focuses on logical design for the development of database system and has two main objectives. First, to describe to describe the logical design. In order to describe the logical design of the database system, we use entity relationship model. And to describe the process logical design, we use another model, we use another tool that is DFD. Data flow diagram. Well, you guys will be working as the system designer in the future. But before you, you design the system, what do you do? You do a, an a analysis of the requirements of your database users. Well, in the analysis stage, you examine the current system and interview the users to determine their information needs. The result of the analysis is usually a narrative description of a business scenario, sometimes, sometimes accompanied by a flow chart. So moving from the analysis stage to a logical system design stage, the focus turns to the creation of logical models that are pictorial presentation of users' information needs. The two aspects of logical design are logical data modeling and logical process modeling. Uh, in this chapter, we will explain logical data modeling using, again, using the entity relationship approach. And we use DFD, data flow diagram, to show the logical process design. Uh, what is the logical data modeling? Let's uh, consider some examples. The managers supervise employees, or the customers place orders, which con uh, consists one or many items ordered another business scenario. 
purchase orders are placed with vendors. These are all the business scenarios involving events in which certain entities are involved. It is information about these events and entities that we would like to represent in the database. So the aim of logical data modeling is to capture information about all the events and entities and to indicate how these events and entities are related such that a database system can eventually be constructed to store data about those events and entities. Well, uh, you may recall the database that we used in the last class. In that database, we have different entities. Well, the entities in a business are examples including uh, the the orders, the the employees, the customers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are entities that you want to maintain information within the database. Well, and in the database, each entity is represented in a table. And within the table, we have different attributes. We use those attributes to maintain the related information about this entity. In the logical data modeling, the analysis attempts to develop a conceptually accurate representation of a real-world business scenario. The goal is to capture semantic or meaning of reality in a model, which is why the process is, is also referred to as semantic data modeling. A number of logical modeling approaches have been proposed. The one that has gained widespread acceptance in the information system community is ER model, which was proposed by Peter Chen in 1976. Uh, another model that has been widely accepted is called UML model, that is Unified Modeling Language. Well, UML is fast becoming the accepted standard for modeling and developing information system. Well, and maybe in the future, in the next uh, two or three years, it is likely that you will be exposed to UM, UML model to quite some degree. So in, in this class, we will learn only the ER model entity relationship diagram to describe the logical data design to reflect a real business scenario logically. Okay, first of all, uh, let's see some fundamentals of ER model. 
The most basic form of chance ER model approach uses rectangles to represent entities and the diamond to represent relationships between entities. Anything that the organization would like to maintain information about is considered an entity. Well, for example, uh, managers, uh, customers, the orders, etc., etc. Those are entities. So The business events, such as sales orders, purchase, or objects, uh, services, or payments to parties, um, cash collections, and service contracts can also be thought of as entities. Since the organization the organization would like to keep information about these entities well uh can you still see my screen suffered from a, a internet issue so can you please wait for one minute to to resolve it i will be back in one minute All right, I'm sorry. Uh, I have I suffered from a internet issue and it's resolved now. Well, let's continue. So we talked about an entity in the ER diagram. An entity is anything that the organization wants to maintain information about. So common entities include uh, the managers, the customers, the employees, the vendors, or items within the orders, and also the business events could also be considered as an entity. For example, sales orders, uh, purchase orders, maintenance request, payments to parties, uh, service contracts, etc., etc. Those things can also be thought of as entities, since the, uh, the organization would like to keep information about these events. Well, this is entity. Relationship. Relationships are nothing but the associations between entities.
So let's consider the following simple scenario regarding a fictitious public accounting firm. Managers supervise professionals. A very simple business scenario in an accounting firm. Analysis of this scenario su suggests that there are two entities. They are managers and professionals. They are related through the act of supervision. The application of ER modeling to this scenario results in simple ER diagram shown in this slide. Note, there are two entity symbols, managers and professionals. And within these two entities, there is another diamond showing the relationship that is supervised that links the two entities. Note here, it is conventional to label the relationship symbol so that the relationship reads from left to right. Thus, the the slides uh, shown here indicates that managers supervise the professionals. We read from left to right rather than professionals supervise managers. Well, let's now expand on the business scenarios. Further de description of the process in this accounting firm reveals that professionals have skills and it is necessary to keep track of which of which skills a professional has the initial er diagram is modified to include a skills entity which is linked to professionals entity via a half relationship the modified ER diagram below can now captures information about another data of interest. So that is the skills. The exact name given to relationships is immaterial. You may use any descriptive, descriptive name. So in other words, the relationship name, supervise or have are not important. You can use any name. Also, Depending on the name given to the relationship, the link related entities can be read in either direction. In the, in the figure above, since the name of the relationship between professional and skills is half, the right way to read the relationship is professionals have skills rather than 
skills have professionals. To read the relationship beginning from the skills entity, the relationship would have to be worded sometimes like possessed by. So in this way, we can read this diagram as skills have uh, the skills are possessed by professionals. So the the exact name given to the relationships is immaterial, and depending on the name given to the relationship, the link between related entities can be read in either direction. So next, let's further extend this business scenario. Upon further analysis of the business process, the analysis determines the following. One, jobs are performed for clients. Two, professionals are assigned to jobs. And lastly, jobs need equipment. So the above year diagram can be further modified to show jobs, clients, and equipment. With these additions, you can see the year model shown in this slide depicts many aspects of the operation of the accounting firm. Well, this is the basic year model. Next, let's take a look at the extended ER model, that is EER. The basic ER model presented above has been the subject of a number of enhancements and extensions. As you can see, the basic ER model shows only entities and the relationships between entities. It doesn't show the type of relationship in terms of the cardinality of each relationship. So in chapter two, you may, you may recall that we have discussed about the relationship cardinality. And it could be either one to one, one to many, or many to many. So the basic ER model in the previous slide shows that managers supervise professionals doesn't show where a manager supervises one or many professionals and whether a professional is supervised by only one or more than one manager. The basic ER model also doesn't indicate whether professionals are mandatory or optional. So this is referred to as the optionality of relationships. Returning to the manager professional diagram. recall that it doesn't show whether 
a manager must be supervising professionals or whether a professional must be supervised by managers. Finally, the basic ER model doesn't show the attributes of each entity and the relationship. And in particular, the primary key of each entity and the relationship. So extended ER model or EER here show all of the above characteristics, including cardinality, optionality, and attributes. So we will now discuss how cardinality, optionality, and attributes of entities and relationships are depicted in ER, extended AR diagram. Consider the relationship between manager and professionals shown in the previous slides. If a if a manager supervises exactly one professional and each professional is supervised by exactly one manager, then the ER diagram is accurate with respect to the cardinality of the relationship between managers and professionals. But now let's assume that a manager can supervise many professionals. But each professional is supervised by only one manager. So that is a, actually more realistic business case. So in this case, the relationship between manager and professionals is one to many. So the ER diagram now can be depicted in this slide. So note here, a bronze foot which is This part, a cross foot at the connection to professional entity is drawn here. The purpose of this cross foot is to show that many professionals are supervised by one manager. The relationship between managers and professionals can be read both ways. You can read it as one manager supervises many professionals, or many professionals are supervised by one manager. So uh, let us modify the, the diagram in this slide to show that it is possible for a professional 
to be supervised by more than one manager. So in other words, a professional may have a different manager on different job that he or she may be working on. So in this case, the relationship between managers and professionals is many to many. As you might suspect, another cross food is drawn on the other side. This is the, the first cross food and another one to show the relationship between managers and professionals is now many to many. Okay, now let's consider how the optionality of relationship is depicted in extended ER. Another entity's participation in a relationship can be either mandatory or optional. So in this managers and professionals example, Let's consider the following business rule. A manager may be supervising many professionals or none at all. None is the least and many is the most. So in other words, for example, a, a newly hired manager may not yet be assigned to supervise any professionals. It is possible in realistic business case. So again, we consider a manager supervise, can supervise none or many professionals. But a professional must be always be supervised by at least one manager and possibly by many managers. So in the terms of EER diagram, we need to show that the participation of professionals is optional and the participation of managers is mandatory. So in this case, it is possible that a manager could not supervise any professionals and many professionals, uh, I mean, Every professional must be supervised by at least one manager. The optional participation of an entity is indicated by this symbol. A circle. To show the participation is option. And mandatory
and its third participation. is represented as a bar. Or a vertical line on the extended ER diagram. So this ER diagram shows that the participation of professionals in the supervisor's relationship is optional, and participation of managers is mandatory. The diagram should be read as follows. Managers may supervise either now or many professionals. Each professional must be supervised by at least one and possibly many managers. Finally, let's see how an ER diagram can be enhanced to show entity attributes. Attributes are shown in an EER diagram using ovals attached to each to each entity or relationship. In the above figure, let's assume that managers have the following attributes. Uh, the manager number which is the primary key of manager, name, office number, phone number, and email. Professionals have these attributes. Professional number, which is the primary key, name, phone number, date hired. And there are no attributes unique to the supervisor's relationship. So in this case, the ER diagram can be shown like this. And please note that the primary K attributes for each entity is underlined. And also, the attributes that are uh, the attributes are often omitted in large the ER diagram because the diagram would become extremely cluttered if each entity's attributes were shown in the diagram. So, uh, to recap, the ER model uses two symbols rectangles for entities and diamond for relationships and extended model uses cross foot to show the many sides of one to many and many to many relationships attributes in the ER diagram are shown using ovals with k attributes or the primary k being underlined a circle or an o next to an entity indicates that the participant the 
participation in the relationship is optional, while a vertical line or a bar indicates the participation is mandatory. So the table in this slide summarizes the various cardinality and optionality variations. The cardinality optionality for entity A is the same in every row. And the cardinality optionality for entity B varies from row to row. You should be able to extrapolate the following entries for variations in cardinality optionality for entity A. Also, the minimum and maximum cardinality for entity A is 1 for every row. Well, uh, this is ER diagram and extended ER diagram. So now let's continue to DFT diagram, which is the tool that we will use to represent the logical data modeling. the logical process modeling, sorry. DFT diagram is used to describe the logical process modeling. And the ER diagram is used to describe the logical data modeling. Well, DFT diagram, is in full name data flow diagram. Data flow diagram can be used to describe processes at different levels. And before we look at the levels of DFT diagram. Let's take a look. What is DFT diagram? Well, the ER modeling approach describes is data oriented. The ER diagram is aimed at logically showing the data structure aspects of the environment under examination. But in contrast, logical process modeling is aimed at showing the ways in which data items are modified. That is, the procedures that modify entities. DFD diagram is useful for modeling and understanding processes and the flow of data relative to processes in a system. A DFD uses only four symbols. It's 
circle to represent process and arrow to represent flows of data. Open-ended rectangle to represent stores of data. And a square box to represent an external entity. The data store symbol should be interpreted to mean a table in a relational database. The external entity symbol is used to signify either a source of data or a destination for data. Next, let's see the levels of DFT, as I just said. The DFT diagram can be used to describe processes at different levels. Well, at the highest level, the DFT is called a context diagram. Context diagram treats the entire information system as one process and shows the input to the system from external or internal entities and the output from the system to external or internal entities. Data stores are not displayed in context level because the data stores are internal to the system. Well, context diagrams are intended to be used by higher level managers, such as uh, controllers and chief information officer, the CIO. Well, these users will likely have an interest in understanding the system at a very high general level. So at this high level, the only thing that they need to know is what inputs are going into the system and who is providing those inputs. What are the output of the system and who is getting the output? This is exactly the context diagram shows. Details of data stores being accessed and the specific subprocess within the system are not relevant to those high level users. Okay, let's return to the accounting firm example. Let's consider an information system for recording client jobs and the assignment of professionals to jobs. The system accepts inputs from two entities. one external client and one internal professional. Clients specify the requirements of each job. Professionals provide input regarding their skills and also 
their availability. Outputs from the system compromise acknowledgments of jobs to clients. Job assignment to professionals and reports of jobs created to managers. Given the input process outputs orientation of the context program and the context diagram from left to right, all flows are shown going from left to right, and all flows are labeled. Flows returning to an entity that provided inputs are also displayed from left to right by repeating the entity to the right of the process. The context diagram for the job recording and assignment information process is displayed in this slide. You should note that the client and professional entities are repeated on the right of the job recording and assignment process. Well, this is the highest level of DFD diagram, context diagram. So the next level referred to as level zero. At this level, the DFD shows the major process in the system interaction between the process and the data stores used to store data. The reason for calling it at level zero is the processes are labeled as 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, 7.0, 8.0, 9.0, 10.0, 11.0, 12.0, 13.0, 14.0, 15.0, 16.0, 17.0, 18.0, 19.0, 20.0, 21.0, 22.0, 23.0, 24.0, 25.0, 26.0, 27.0, 28.0, 29.0, level of each major process. Okay, as you can see, in this process, extracted from the context diagram, two major processes are extracted. They are record job and assign professionals. And each of them is assigned as process point uh, dot zero. With one dot zero is record job and two dot zero is assign professionals. So this slide shows the two main processes. It also shows the data stores accessed or updated by the process. Note here that every data flow is labeled. record job process or the one of zero process gets input from the client accesses the client this data store and adds an entry to jobs data store 
So in this case, when a new entry is added to job data store, that means a new job is created. And let's look at the second process, assign professionals. This process accesses the jobs, professionals, and professional skills data store. It also receives input from professionals regarding their skills and availabilities. Well, this process adds an entry to the job assignment data store, which shows the specific jobs to which each professional is assigned. The record job process generates a job acknowledgement, which is sent to the client, while the assigned professional process generates a job assignment sheet, which is given to professionals and also reports, which are given to managers. So this is the description of level zero DFD. Again, in this level, major processes, major processes uh, extracted from context diagram are displayed here. So the next level, the next lower level expanded from dot zero process is DFD level one. In this level, well, of course, it is more detailed levels and those more detailed processes are displayed at this level. Processes are broken down even further. At level one DFD, it expands on each of the dot zero process in a level zero DFD. So this is an example of level one DFD, which is which displays more details. A level one DFD explains on each of the zero process. It provides details about what exactly is involved in the assignment, assigned professional process. Uh, checking skills of professionals, checking their availabilities, and actually making the assignments are the three sub process involved. Well, unlike, unlike in the DFD, uh, level zero DFD. Not all the processes in the level one DFD would have the process execution recorded in the table. In level zero DFD, for the 
job recording and assignments system. Execution of the two higher level process need to be recorded in data store because they are the main processes that the organization would like to plan, control, and manage. The purpose of level one DFD is simply to provide more details regarding the steps involved with within the particular level zero DFD. Ex execution of check skills and check availability. These two sub processes are not each recorded in data store because these steps are just intermediate steps leading to the main step of actually making assignment. Of course, execution of the final make assignment step is recorded in the data store. As with the level zero DFD, in the level one DFD, data flows between external or internal entities and processes must always be labeled because they indicate the specific inputs and outputs flowing from or to entities. The labels on flows between external or internal entities are processes helps us understand exactly what input is being provided to a process and exactly what output is being generated by the process. Data flows between data stores and processes generally have obvious meanings. Errors originating from a data store indicate that the, the, the data store is being accessed, while errors going to a data store indicate that the data store is being updated. By updated, we mean that Either new data is being added or existing data is being changed. It is possible to have a double headed error between a process and a data store, indicating that the data store is being accessed to read certain data and is also being subsequently updated. So uh, in this figure, Please note that the flows between the level one process indicate the flow of control within the process. So in other words, the, the result of check scales process is passed to the check availability process and so on. Given that the flows between data store and processes are generally obvious, it is common practice to 
to not label those flows. So, while there's no magical formula for consistently generating a good DFD diagram, here are some general guidelines to follow. First, to determine the scope of the system. Second, to identify the processes involved and the relationship, relationship between two processes. Third, to identify the data stores that will be accessed or updated. Lastly, label all the DFD elements oh, and finally, to avoid unnecessary overlapping data flow lines. A number of computer-based tools are available for constructing DFDs. For example, uh, Microsoft Visio. This is a popular tool for constructing a variety of flow charts and diagrams in the business world. So this is the end of this class. Let me So this is the end of this class and also the second last class of this course in this semester. In the next class, we will discuss some physical design rules for database system. Well, before I leave, do you have any other questions? If you do, please, uh, you can open your microphone and talk to me directly or leave a message in the chat box.